Okay, great. I think we're ready to get started. So welcome everyone. Uh, I know it's beautiful weather in uh, Europe today. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining us. And I want to start with thanking our partner Smart Ad Server for hosting this uh, event today. Um, let's start with something fun, I hope. So can you tell me where is everybody from? Just use the chat function and wrong answers only. So let's see if we can have a laugh there. So where are you from? Wrong answers only. Okay. A lot of Paris, Belgium. And please make sure you hit the panelists and attendees. Amsterdam, obviously. And yes, it's beautiful weather over here, which is quite unique. I know Christina is sitting in the garden. Nick, how's London? What? Good. Okay, then we can get started. So um, welcome to the panel. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start with a quick intro on uh, LiveRamp and what we're going to discuss today. And then uh, I'm going to introduce my fellow uh, panel, uh, panel uh, members. So first about LiveRamp, uh, so we're the leader in data connectivity and what we've done. Uh, so we work with a lot of different brands uh, and we make <coughs> sorry, addressability possible for them. So we basically allow data-driven advertising and marketing and with third-party cookies going away, uh, there is a shift happening on the uh, pretty much in the entire ecosystem. Uh, but that means that uh, for uh, to, to keep addressability, we need to change some of the mechanisms in the ecosystem. And so that's what we've done at LiveRamp. Uh, we've built an infrastructure that is, uh, being, that is able to function when third-party cookies away, go away. We've kind of reimagined how that will work. And what we did is we made it based on deterministic data, which means that people actually authenticate. So when they uh, log in with their email address or their phone number, that data point can then be used and uh, shared with an advertiser. Now, we don't do a universal ID. So whatever we do only works in the context of that publisher and that specific brand. And that's something uh, that's a big change, um, we believe for the good. And that's something that we're gonna discuss today. We've launched ATS about, and so that's the authenticated traffic solution. And that's how we kept the C infrastructure that, we, that I talked about. Um, when we started, I think about 12 to 18 uh, months ago, uh, we've, uh, right now we have about 33 billion impressions live every day. We have about 25 SSPs uh, integrated, 20, uh, 45 DSPs, and about 400 publishers signed and ready uh, to deploy, and some of them have uh, deployed already. So, and it's available in the US, uh, EMEA, and APAC. And then obviously, Smart Ad Server is also one of our partners. So, with that, I'm going to start introducing the rest of the panels so that we can start talking about addressability. And then I'm going to start left to right here on my screen, which means, Christina, you may go first. Hi, everybody. I'm from Rome, from Milan in this moment. <laughs> and I am the CEO of the Digital Bloom uh, and other tech networks uh, based in Italy. Thanks you hey. very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Bernard. Hey, guys. Thanks, Tim. Uh, my name is Bernard Frede. Um, I work for uh, eBay Benelux. Uh, that's Mark Plaas and Tweede Hans. I work as a data strategist, so working on data propositions and our uh, data strategy. That's Thanks, Bernard. And Nick. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nick Floods, Global Commercial Operations Director at Future. Future are uh, a uh, global platform that supports uh, hundreds of brands, digital and, and print, and also specialist services as well, such as uh, price comparison. I uh, see hundreds of millions of users a year, and I'm responsible for the ad technology stack and all the teams uh, surrounding that. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we have three very different publishers here. Uh, here, that's something that we figured out when we did the prep call. Uh, even though, like, uh, we're uh, all publishers, uh, the way we collect data, the way we use data, can be very different. And then, uh, Nick, I think I'm just going to start with you. Like, what do you think are the, the what do you see as the biggest challenges for you at the moment? Yeah, uh, well, not not just for future, I think, but for for all publishers actually in the ecosystem as a as a whole is uncertainty, uh, and that's a word that gets bounded around a lot. If you, if you think about it, I don't think we've ever been in a more uncertain time. Uh, we're not aware of specific timeframes for, for upcoming changes. Uh, we're living in a world where we're having to address multiple platforms and multiple uh, targeting um, solutions uh, in a continually increasing rate. 
So uh, you mentioned at the start of your um, uh, your introduction to the session, of course, we're waiting for, for cookies to deprecate, but of course, they've been gone for a number of years uh, on certain platforms through ITP. And Apple are only increasingly getting more uh, privacy focus with the announcement a couple of days ago that are going to start stripping out IPs and emails uh, from, from their email products. So I think we move into a more uncertain world, but it does actually present, I think, a number of opportunities for premium publishers that have good scale and also good intent audiences, because ultimately advertisers and agencies are going to want to reach large proportions of their clients, or sorry, their, their addressable audience or their customer base with as few connections or as few deals as possible. And that's our belief. So I think future world position for that, but also I think the industry still has time to steer the conversation. Uh, and there are, of course, a number of alternate proposals out there to privacy sandbox. And obviously privacy sandbox being the, the predominant one that, that Google are pushing, but there are and is uh, ongoing discussion in a myriad of different forums as to what's best for the industry. But I think probably what's most important is that we just make sure we don't replicate what we've done in the past which has led to the same privacy concerns. So, um, so supportive of anything that increases user privacy, but we need to make sure, obviously, as a multi-billion pound business, that, as in the ads ecosystem, uh, that we can continue to uh, trade effectively. Thanks. Yeah, it's never, uh, there's never a boring week. Uh, we can cover a bit of the Apple announcements uh, later. Uh, I just actually realized that I haven't even introduced myself, so a rookie mistake. I'll fix that right now. Hey, my name is Tim Guinan. I'm the Managing Director for Addressability in Europe for Libra. Joint Libra for Acquisition. Uh, I had a company called uh, Factor, a privacy technology company operating consent management platform, and I've been in programmatic for uh, over a decade. So quick intro, but now we can uh, move on. So uh, Bernard, on your side, like uh, similar challenges as, as Nick, or is it different over at eBay? Yeah, of course, um, a lot of challenges uh, we've been working on also uh, like uh, post cookie era for a while now, I think for almost one and a half years now, uh, thinking and creating hypotheses what the effect could be for a publisher, but not only us as a publisher, but we're also uh, an advertiser in that case. So it, it works both ways within our organization. And uh, obviously we see and we're expecting huge impact there. We already see uh, some impact on the ATT when Apple came uh, through with the update. But I think it's also uh, changes where you have to think as an organization and ask yourself some ethical questions, what you want to do with these privacy changes within the ecosystem. And I think, uh, yeah, I think it's very important to also uh, create a more transparent uh, strategy towards your user or towards the users, um, what those changes are. But I think that's also things that you need to create guidelines to also help your advertisers still using or still reaching those users at the right moment in the platform, especially a platform like uh, like eBay and Marplots. Uh, where we figured out in that first call that your situation is slightly different, right? And we're going to... Yeah. And maybe we'll get back to that later, but also like uh, let's dive into the ATT part here, as in like, what did you guys do uh, to accommodate for that change? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So in regards to privacy, I think that, that is a, that's a pillar that um, uh, comes highly uh, within our strategy. And therefore we send out an email towards all our users in the Benelux region where we explain to our user what's going on in the market. So uh, we're gonna, you're gonna get a pop-up, you're gonna get a prompt in your app asking uh, for us or Apple to track your data. Um, this is the reason why, and this is the, this is the outcome effect. And I think we wanted to, to give more guidelines, more information to our users. And in the end, we saw a, a positive effect. We saw the opt-in rate for, uh, for iOS going up uh, and that's positive and obviously I think every um, every major app companies uh, do see a decline in opt out, and that that makes sense. You know, it's it's like uh, uh, we need to give that transparent option towards our users. So it, it's also a good case, in my opinion. Can you be transparent in the uh, uptake you saw? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think we saw currently we're seeing a opt out rate of sixty five percent on iOS. Yeah, and after you sent that email, what was the result? Well, we, we firstly saw it, it went from 5% opt-in to 10%. And after the email we sent uh, to all our users, we see our going up uh, the opt-in rate um, um, at the 35%. So that, that was positive in our opinion. Okay. Uh, however, still uh, with the major logging that we have, it's still a huge impact. 
Thanks. And then Christina, same question to you, basically, and some of the biggest challenges. Absolutely, yes. Um, under um, our point of view, we have a different position because we work with a lot of different publishers. So, we, so it means uh, a lot of different uh, first party data. I think that first point, uh, this, uh, oh, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for all publishers that can reevaluate their first party data. And this is real important because if you are a publisher that have a free contents and that not have under registration a lot, a big part of its contents, it could be um, in complex in this moment. Uh, transform or convert uh, user in uh, um, deterministic identifier. So um, we can see this um, as a big game changer uh, with some concerns, but I think that we have to move uh, with a new normal in which uh, uh, publisher have to understand uh, new KPIs uh, to evaluate the audience uh, and uh, probably uh, it means more quality, more transparency, and uh, mm, a, real, mm, a, a really collaboration also with advertiser. So, and, and, sorry, and, it is very and, big. <laughs> it's very complex. I, we un I understand. In, in your case, where you have so many different uh, uh, publishers partaking, so many different domains, per definition, from uh, next to each other, they're all third party data, right? So uh, they're not a single first party in, in that context. Um, how do you think about you should manage data across those domains or just will all that data live in, in smaller silos by them by itself? Yeah, there are different uh, uh, positions about the cross domain managing feedback data because uh, uh, especially in Italy, we have uh, uh, different domains under the same uh, properties, the same publisher. And so the sa it's uh, only uh, big one for first party data, but uh, in, uh, we have a lot of uh, networks uh, and this is not always the uh, property strategy. So what we suggest, what I suggest is uh, uh, define a, a scaled partner, tech partner that can be uh, can guarantee cross operability, best integration in uh, multiple technologies. Uh, and so we can grow in any case. Also, if we don't have a uh, multiple domains, uh, uh, also with the multiple domains uh, first party data strategies, because uh, I think that it's very important don't create a single silos, but a, a very cross operational environment. This is a complex uh, new. I've, I've heard a publisher once say, look, we have 100 domains and we're going to move them all to one domain and everyone gets a subdomain. Um, do you yeah. think that's reasonable? And Nick, this question is going to hit you next as well, because Future obviously has a lot of different websites, but let's start with Christina. Like, do you think that that can become a reality in, in like in the digital boom universe? Yes, I am in this moment. Yeah, I, I suppose uh, that um, it's very important to uh, uh, change uh, ad tech strategy and ad tech stack, especially uh, towards uh, the new standard previs. And, the, and what we uh, talk about, what we say to our publisher is, uh, um, is uh, a change uh, the way which they talk and uh, think about what is the first party data and um, the, the volume and the value of this, uh, of this data. Uh, in particular, we, um, we imagine that all middle and little publisher, not only big publisher, have to cooperate to create a new environment in which uh, uh, technology can, can work together and advertiser can inject their ideas uh, that match against uh, publishers' ideas. This is, I think, that this is a really the the most important uh, way to facing this game changer. Not exactly having a unique uh, um, aggregate environment in which we inject uh, specific uh, our um, 
our single universal ID. Okay, thank you. Then Nick. Uh, I think that's crazy. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine the future would ever do that. Uh, I mean, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh, so, and yeah, I've spent, spent my time in digital publishing uh, and uh, spent a lot of time on SEO and you just, you just lose all, all authority uh, for that domain. So uh, I think single domain publishers uh, have, have it kind of easy uh, because they've got one property to, to worry about, right? I've yeah. got uh, 100, 160 domains-ish uh, to, to, to make sure um, we can effectively trade uh, amongst each other, but also uh, with, with third parties. So I think that the risk thing is, is one point, but you know, you've got to flip on its head. You can't, we can't look at this as it's going to happen. This is, this is not going away. Uh, and the industry, I think, has continually dealt with challenges as, it, as it's been faced and turned them into opportunity, and we will find a way. So uh, I'm trying to be a bit more positive about it, but definitely uh, you won't see uh, future.com forward slash Tom's Guide uh, or Tom's Guide dot future dot com. It just won't, it just won't happen. Uh, so that's 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 not a strategy. You think? Okay. Okay. Hey, um, in your uh, in in the beginning, you said something about we shouldn't repeat the same mistakes. If you look at the current offering in the landscape of, of solutions for world poster party cookies, do you feel that that's going where it needs to be? Uh, I think there, there's definitely some movement towards that. So maybe taking it away from cookies and moving it to an e email address potentially that is then shared in, a, in an ID graph. And um, there are some solutions that are then going to build upon that. Uh, so you can start to see how that potentially would be used. Great ask on Digiday this morning about how publishers might reverse engineer flock uh, segments and cohorts. It's a good example, which I highly recommend everyone reads. So um, so I think I think it's about what, what happens um, and how the, the, the premium publishers uh, try to guide it. But ultimately, um, as I keep banging on about, it's, it's really where the agencies and clients go and where they have trust in technology solutions that address their needs. And it's publishers' jobs ultimately to be able to effectively trade with them. Future's position is we will effectively trade with anyone in whichever kind of method they want to. So we've already deployed a number of ID solutions, LiveRap included, ATS, of course, uh, to make sure that we're we're ready with whatever happens. But it's very clear, I think, for the for the industry, that we're at very very early days. You know, tests are just starting with Privacy Sandbox. And I bring it back to the fact that you know we've been here with Safari and Firefox for, for close to four years now in varying degrees of, of, of stages. So hopefully publishers have effective solutions already to trade on um, Safari and, and Firefox browsers. And that comes back to you know effectively how you trade uh, your business. So do you offer contextual? Do you offer first party audience? Have you got a good DMP in place? Have you got a good CDP in place? What what is your first party data strategy? And I think what whatever happens, you know. Publishers may not have much dev resource. It doesn't mean they can't execute a good contextual um, strategy with bringing in a single partner. So I think it's about choosing your battles and making sure that you pick the effective uh, trading mechanism that works for your business. And ultimately, moving away from open auction, right? And then you're not affected. Uh, and that's the big focus for us is, uh, you know, we've got a huge business, you know, hundreds of millions of users a month come to our properties. We do loads of money in open auction. But really, the, the drive is, and the majority of the money is in first party and premium programmatic, where we control the sell and we control the first party targeting criteria. So that's the that's the aim, of course, significantly uh, high yield into. I think it's fair to say that there won't be a silver bullet, right? Like there's not one solution that will make all your worries go away, and there never was. It was it's that simple. So Bernard, in your case, which what we found out in the prep is like. For example, for to do addressable advertising, you need a decent number of authentications. Like you need people to actually register. For a classified website like Mark Platz and, and, and eBay and, and, and Tveda Hans, that number that you have is significantly higher than average in, in Europe. Um, how's that like, what did you do with that already? As in like, because you already had different opportunities. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think it was is definitely um, uh, definitely our leverage. I think uh, both Netherlands and Belgium, we have over ninety percent login uh, authenticated users. So yeah, that that's that's massive leverage in regards also to first party advertising. And I think that will still be our strength within the future if, if it if it comes to first party advertising. Um, however, uh, it, it, we still need to be addressable also for the outside world, also for advertisers. So 
like one and a half year, two years ago, we, we thought about, okay, th this is going to happen. Well, how do we need to act on that? And then we thought, okay, with the authentication that we have in our platform, we need to build bridges between those advertisers and our platform. So for a year ago, we already started working with, uh, with CRM on borders who can match hash, hash data with, with our platform. And we work now with a couple and I also ATS is also coming. So that's in the planning for us. And I think, that is also something um, we need to explain to our advertisers, but also to explain to our users, because within this roadmap, eh, data has kind of a bad view nowadays in regards to privacy, because I think building those bridges and reaching those authenticated users, not only for targeting, but also for exclusion, because we see so much waste in, in the digital ecosystem. We see users getting reached with the same ad, over and over and over uh, in regards to retargeting. So with authenticated solutions, we also want to exclude them and make sure they don't get uh, get annoyed. So yeah, we, we've been we've been working with CRM on borders for a while now. And yeah, we saw some use cases. And I think this is only a strategy that will slowly build out within the, within, within the future. So we also have control. And with control, I also mean... I think also what Christina said, we want to build partnerships, more direct partnerships, more uh, if it's either uh, targeted on first party advertising or it's con uh, contextual or it's based on custom audiences with maybe lookalike modeling. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that's still important for our strategy and our strategy towards our advertisers because uh, I think we're in a different position because we're classified and, and people come to our platform with a certain goal to succeed and and, and advertising is a big part of it. Uh, and so we want to give the opportunity also for a user so uh, to, to reach that goal. And I think addressability, uh, especially in the near future, is becoming harder, but nonetheless important. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to get back to that later because I'm really curious what your brand customers uh, thought about the, the uh, opportunity that they got, like, did it work better? But first, like, I want to wrap it up with Christina here around this question is like, for, for you, the authentication rates have been uh, traditionally uh, lower. I, I don't think it was a focus point, right? So what's the strategy going forward there? Yes. Okay. We choose Combing Clean last year, at the end of last year, a, a deterministic people-based identifier uh, to create universal ideas. Waiting for Google strategies, uh, uh, which is, in my opinion, not exactly under control of publisher. We prefer uh, explain to our publishers that they have to bring back under their control the monetization and the, the weight of the first party data. So in uh, looking for and, uh, and find a solution, tech solution that could be um, enough for us and valid for us and for our partners, we uh, taking in consideration four, four criteria. First, uh, the tech solution uh, um, must have uh, a demand at your side, at its height. Um, and it's very important to create a, a deterministic identity graph that can match against uh, publisher ideas. As it's very important that uh, we can create also uh, tech solutions. We can have also tech solutions that can interoperate uh, in the complex programmatic environment. And uh, last but not least, uh, least <laughs> um, the, comp the complete compliance with the privacy regulation all over the world. Because uh, advertising data and publisher data comes from came from every, everywhere. And uh, it's uh, very important that we imagine uh, an in, a big world that can and have to interoperate. So these four criteria, um, let me choose the ATS solution conveniently because uh, I, I'd like to understand how many, how, how part of my traffic under my control is an authenticated traffic. Only 
you know, with these uh, analysis, I can understand um, how many users can be converted in the universal ID and the amount of traffic that can became eligible, eligible for biggest company, for trustable advertiser, because in the next futures, probably, um, the biggest trustable advertiser, the best campaign, uh, we look for authenticated traffic. Yes, we don't forget contextual targeting, which is the granular strategies of uh, by, by yeah, Christina, sorry, that, that was my point I was trying to make earlier that uh, it's all well and good having IDs, but ultimately people need to buy against them. So it's it's about that alignment, right? Uh, and so I think with the, the myriad of ID solutions out there in the market at the moment, uh, which I think have tipped over 100 now at last count, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to, to pick a, um, a winning horse. Uh, and inevitably that's going to be you know, 10, 10 ID solutions that are picked up by publishers. So uh, yeah, it's good. It's good to to see a number of um, uh, big media uh, big media companies kind of falling behind them, but we will obviously see where the agency groups go. And I think um, uh, there's just no traction there yet. Well, there is traction, but not obviously uh, compared to open option spend. So as we get closer to hopefully some dates coming out at some point for when this is all going to happen, we'll start to see spend shifted and shifted and shifted until eventually that day arrives when um, when 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 you have to trade like this. Or one of the mechanisms. To that point, because like that's super. Yeah. So like there is supply and uh, I, there is demand, and we've been evangelizing that like pretty uh, fiercely throughout Europe. But what are you doing as a publisher yourself, and like, um, like how are you bringing this to agencies and, and brands? Like, what's your proposition? Uh, is that for me? Yeah. Tim? Yeah. Okay. So just um, just having conversations actually still. So uh, I think you know good good old uh, media conversations about where and um, what's the direction of travel, uh, where where companies see um, see benefits. So uh, regularly, uh, probably two times a week, I'm having conversations with senior agency uh, folk who are involved in this part of um, part of the business to make sure we're trying to align ourselves as a publisher uh, to, to to ultimately what they, what they want. And and you know inevitably we're going to have multiple solutions because not all trading. Um, uh, agency uh, groups are going to have the same uh, same solution that's already becoming um, very evident, which is totally fine. And publishers uh, can kind of prepare themselves for that, but they just need to know and have those conversations. Then I think um, industry bodies as well play a big part of this. So uh, obviously you've got the AOP uh, in the UK, the IAB, and, and the direction that they set there. And it's great that Universal ID is now open sourced and run by IAB Tech Lab. Which kind of helps, I think, significantly kind of move move that on as a very viable um, solution. I uh, do you think like there's enough knowledge on, on how to set up addressable campaigns on on the brand and agency side? Uh, uh, God, I'm trying to remember the analogy, but it's uh, it's like raising all ships at the same time in the harbor. I can't quite remember, yeah, but um, anyway, that's kind right. of what I feel like. So it's we're, we're doing something quite new here, and you know your own products, you know. Uh, signed with 400 publishers, which is amazing. It's a significant scale, uh, but obviously you need the the, the the buy side as well, which you know is starting to come online now. I think, and and there is a lot of work to do on both sides to make sure it kind of raises together. It's it's a typical marketplace, right? Uh, so uh, I'm sure Bernard sees that every, every day at eBay. It literally is all about supply and demand. Bernard, do you want to chime in? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, it's also something we've been uh, speaking about in the market for a while now. So with the advertisers and agency, but to be honest, there's also so many articles going on about addressability, about identity solutions. However, the, 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 the matter is very complex. The majority of the people don't really understand it because what you see in, uh, with advertising, you see within agency specific groups or specific teams within the organization are working on the identity strategy, are working on the authentication strategy. However, that layer hasn't come through to our, uh, the, the buying layers within, uh, within the advertisers and within the agency. So it's still, we, we've, been, we've been speaking about it. Um, however, in my opinion, uh, we need also to test. We need, we need case building. We need to- It's test and learn, really. Test and learn. And then, and then you can, uh, then you can describe the process from A to Z. How does it work? What is, does an advertiser need to do to uh, to buy in an in authenticated uh, or identity based campaigns? What do you need to do for? Uh, there's there's so many more factors going on 
if it's starting from legal to the solution itself, to the strategy, uh, to those, the expectations. And I think if, if you're making the choice as a publisher to, to work with certain identity solutions, then you need to provide also case building. And I think that is, that is the best way of going forward to like uh, see what it does and what the effect of it is. What do you think is the expectation of advertisers when they do a addressable campaign, when they actually target data from their CRM or they do suppression, like you said, what's the expectation? Um, what, what we see, to give an example, what we've seen in the last few months, uh, especially of the new version of ITP almost over a year now, is that we, we saw drops in match rates massively. And if, if you're going to look at data infrastructures that publishers have people working with uh, DMPs going over to CDPs, uh, SSPs, DSPs, within the whole frame, within the whole ecosystem, we see cookies going from one tech to another, and we see drops of 15%, 20%. And in the end, there's such a low, uh, lots, such a low volume of uh, of audiences that need to be targeted. It's like pace going back in campaigns. So, the the, the uh, and that's obviously not really positive. So, if you ask me the question, what will be the the positive outcome is high match rates, high volume testing, A B testing, and I think uh, that's something uh, you need skill for, and that is currently lacking within the market, or has been lacking for a while now to to gain that reach. And you need to be a big publisher with either authenticated or without first probably data uh, um, uh, to suffice this for 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 the advertisers. Otherwise, yeah, then then it's it makes sense to go more from, okay, let's go contextual. Christina, like, from an Italian perspective, what do you think are the expectations from a brand or an agency if they're running an addressable campaign based on CRM data? Like, do they expect like extraordinary results or are they just looking to test and learn? Okay, uh, in short term, in short terms, uh, um, we, um, I don't have uh, a expectation under a monetization point of view. It's a moment to prepare, it's a moment to test, it's, uh, it's time to test, it's time to learn by doing as, a, in a, as we start with the programmatic uh, environment. It's important that don't waste this time. It's important that advertisers and agency which have different uh, risks and opportunities in this uh, uh, big uh, game changer but it's important that we um, we can create uh, the properly environment. So DSP, SSPs, um, and also technical uh, solution have to work together. We have to build the new standards. We have to build new strategies to um, to map our audience and uh, contents. Uh, is, uh, we say always, content is the king. <laughs> I think that this is really the, uh, the, 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 the really in the center of a, uh, in the center of our of publishers uh, opportunity. There is a, absolutely the, the need to create uh, content with value, uh, trustable for their audience. We have to uh, create that advertiser. Advertiser also, um, it's a very important that they start to push in a new ecosystem their own data, first party data, because an ID solution works if we can find ideas in the programmatic environments. But when all of this could be reality, uh, advertiser can buy media more efficiently and uh, with a return of investment uh, higher. And um, I know that programmatic uh, was a buyer driven uh, evolution. And I suppose that also this game changer will be buyer or advertiser driven um, um, project, as I said. <laughs> but, uh, in um, publisher can play a central role this time. This is a very important. Uh, I agree. Against us. But very often I see that like going back to, okay, we have content, so we will be fine. Like we'll do contextual signals. It's gonna be great. 
but many people seem to forget how easy and effective uh, it is to buy within uh, Google or, or Amazon or Facebook. So that's like something, those are the capabilities that you want to start matching up against. Um, I, we have a question here from the Dutch IAB chairman, Cook Task Force Cookulus, Robin. Thanks for your question, Robin. Uh, Bernard, I believe it's for you, uh, but Nick already addressed it as well with the uh, Apple update. So maybe the two of you can have a look at it. Uh, and obviously I also have something to say about it, but I'll leave it to you guys. But oh, the question is, yeah. uh, oh, sorry, it's yeah. just the panelists. So I'll read out the question loud, sorry. Uh, with the update of the WWDC regarding the hashing of email address, so that was the Apple developer conference, will and if so, how impact the matching possibilities with audiences? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take you on. So uh, I can't remember who it was, but I saw on Twitter someone referenced it as kind of burner emails in, in the same way that um, the drug war might use burner phones. So I think it's going to provide a, a significant uh, issue actually for, for those businesses that ultimately rely on that. But also it's going to impact publisher metrics, right? So just simple things like the ability to know how many people opened up an email, how many clicked on an email, uh, and all the standard metrics that we're probably already used to. So I think that'll be um, that'll provide a big challenge. Uh, another part of the change as well, though, was that Apple are going to start hiding IP addresses, which of course provides significant um, difficulties for those businesses that build ID graphs uh, in that manner or use that as a signal particularly yeah. to start to bring multiple devices under a single household. They leave in the base, so just adding to that, they leave in the basic elements. Like you can still do a region, state, and and a country. So basic yeah. functionality still exists. Uh, but yeah, for fingerprinting purposes, it's it's no longer, uh, it doesn't do anything for you anymore. Yeah, well, of course you shouldn't be doing fingerprinting anyway, but yeah, I, I, I can imagine, um, imagine this is gonna affect a lot of businesses uh, in, a, in a pretty brutal way actually on the ad tech side. Let's call them soft signals. Um, <laughs> Bernard, um, what's your take? Yeah, I know, I think it's a difficult one to be honest. Uh, also in terms of expectations and in terms of rollout, uh, I think it's a good update, uh, but it, it will, this affect, I know it's, people also log in with, with, with the same email address for years now with Mark Plus and Tweede Hans, and that will, that will stay the same. I don't know what will change in regards to the Burma emails. Um, yeah, I think that the, the I think the, the 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 how do you say that the, the match we also would do with with clients with advertisers will maybe be tougher within the future. We do now a lot of matching with our to encrypted ideas, hashed ideas, yeah, and then you come Apple, and I think more will gain towards the Apple environment. Um, but yeah, we we'll have to see what what that impact will have us. Uh, yeah, I don't think we we can make proper expectations for now. I think yeah, let's, let's see if the, uh, that's what I was just going to say, let's see if the rumors are true as well and Apple bring out uh, an ad product, of course, uh, which is uh, well rumored. So, uh, so we'll see what happens there. I'm sure with loads of targets and capabilities. Yeah, if you just look at the hiring page, uh, they, they have a lot of open roles for advertising. Unfortunately, they hired uh, a wrong person, or at least in their own view, uh, but that was more like a Twitter uh, thing. Um, Look, the, the, the thing is, basically the web is dividing, right? So you're going to have a version of the web that is that you subscribe to, like you pay for it. It's not going to have tracking. It's, it's going to have minimal advertising. Um, but how many subscriptions can you have? I have 140 euros per month in subscriptions uh, to uh, several environments from Netflix to Fortnite to Spotify. There's a limit to that at what you can pay as a family. So there is going to be a different version of the web as well that is going to be addressable, like it's going to be measurable, people will be logged in, it will be paid for by advertising. And there's going to be a contextual version of the internet. Uh, when it comes to like, when you look at uh, how uh, the the uh, the relay function from Apple uh, works, it's going to be a paid product, it's called iCloud Plus. So it's, it's going to be for a certain group of people who will be able to take more subscriptions or spend time and effort on, on doing this. Uh, ultimately, I think that group uh, will be relatively uh, small. We have one more question, question and four minutes left. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, do you think first party data will push the shift to uh, PMPs and uh, programmatic guarantee based deals rather than open auction or will open auction will still maintain value with contextual? Christina, you may take yeah. that one. Okay, mm, in my, it's not so easy answer. Eh? <laughs> uh, 
uh, we have to look in the future. But um, in my opinion, we probably, um, I suppose that um, the media buyer strategies uh, um, will use the PMP and programmatic guarantee, especially based on the contextual or with the specific white listing of uh, uh, brand sites. While the open internet uh, could grow in value thanks to uh, thanks to the universal idea, the, the opportunity to find in a very large exchange exactly um, their ideas, uh, their first party data, um, their advertisers for first party data. So I think that um, we can have different strategies of buying and different strategies of selling, completely different because uh, universal ID have um, more value, okay. Uh, and I suppose that this is the, the possible way um, in which we are working in this moment. I wanna add to that, like from a life run perspective, pretty much all the campaigns that we see addressable, like based on first party yeah. data right now are PMP or PG based. Um, the open auction, there's a significant difference in CPM versus contextual and then addressable signals, even though there's also significant skill difference at the moment. So uh, I, I do think it's gonna be largely PMP and, and PG uh, based, uh, uh, at least for the next 12 months. Um, very short, like we have two minutes left. Uh, I, we have co covered all the questions, so I hope everyone is is is, is happy. Um, what is the percentage of uh, what percentage of authenticated data would be the holy grail? And the answer should just be a percentage. Nick, you may go first. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a percentage, but it depends on the kind of business you operate, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it varies and uh, it, it means different amounts to, to each individual business. Not all publishers will get to 100% ever, but that's not a problem. Bernard. Oh, tough one. Um, yeah, it really depends, but I would say above 50%. Cool. Christina. In my opinion, 50% of our user or 70% of our traffic, it depends. Okay. With that, I'd like to uh, end it and I would like to thank you very much. Christina, Bernard, and uh, Nick, really, really great. Uh, thank you for uh, the transparency and, and like your wise answers. Um, I think we're just going to wrap it up. Like it was very, uh, it was very enjoyable to do this panel. Thank you again to Smart Ad Server for hosting the Global Ad Tech Media event. And uh, please do invite us again, and we'll be here again. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Bye-bye.